Hello everyone. Um, this video we will look at um, a very important topic in economics, and that is game theory. And we will begin by looking at some basic definitions. And then we'll look at how to find a Nash equilibrium as well as how to find a dominant strategy. Then we will look at a very famous example, which is called the prisoner's dilemma. Uh, it's a very famous and very classical example of game theory, and we'll study that as well as the implication of that particular game. And then we will look at some mixed strategy games, as well as looking at an example of a mixed strategy game and the application of that. Uh, game theory is the study of decision making. And in the second line, I've copied for you the formal mathematical definition of what a game theory is. Um, it's really about how to, you know, how to make the correct moves so that you get the best return in the complicated situation. And that's really what game theory is about. And when you hear the term games, don't don't think that it's you know, don't, don't think that, it, that we're talking about some kind of game, like a video game or card game. That, that's not what game theory is about. In game theory, we're looking at a lot of complicated real-life situations. And for example, when you have firms competing, that might be a game, right? Uh, you have companies competing. And in politics, you might have you know, different parties competing. That's also a game. That also can, can be modeled by game theory. And you might have in biology, uh, game theory will also be able to explain, uh, for instance, why certain animals behave certain ways. Why do they fight for territory? Why do they fight for food? Or how do they fight for food? That can also that could also be modeled using game theory. So you can see it's not all about um, playing a game, playing cards, or playing gambling. That's not really what game theory is about. Um, a game a game could be in extensive form or simultaneous form. The difference is that in an extensive form game, one player goes first and the other player will follow. They take turns. So chess, for example, might be a simultaneous, uh, extensive form of game. You have one player moving first, and then you have the black pieces moving after the white pieces, and then you have the white pieces moving again. They take turns to move. That's extensive form games. This is also called the normal form games, because most games are, in fact, in that form. And, in fact, in, the, in this lecture, we will not look at extensive form games. We will only look at simultaneous games, which is when um, players make the moves at the same time. And a typical example of a simultaneous game might be rock, paper, and scissors. Right? You can't play one after the other, because then the person moving last will, will, will always win. It's the, they, they play the games at the same time, so that's, that's what it's called simultaneous games. And this is what we will be looking at in this video. A game could also be cooperative or non-cooperative. A non-cooperative game might be two companies competing for land, for territory, right? Com two companies competing for space. Well, they're fighting against each other, so if one person is better, it, it wins something, that means the other person will lose something, so they're always fighting. A cooperative game might be where, let's say, you and your friend are doing a project together. And you're cooperating and that you guys can be better off. You guys can be, both of you can be better off or worse off, depending on the actions you take. And in this case, you want to cooperate with your friend to achieve the best return for both of you. And this is an example of a cooperative game. In a game, you have the players, the strategies, and the payoffs. The players are the people who are playing this game. So in a chess game, for example, the players could be the white pieces and the black pieces. And in an, in an election, your players might be candidate A and candidate B. In a competition, your players might be company A and company B. So your players don't have to be actual persons, they can be an entity, they can be a company or even animals or even firms or groups of people and so on. And then you have the strategies. So the strategies are the available moves by each player. So as the black player, as the white player of the chess game, you know, you have certain moves, so that's your strategy. 
And as black players, you also have certain moves, you can move certain pieces, so that's your strategy. For two competing companies, for example, your strategies might be a little different. For example, your strategy might be to develop a new, a new product or to not to develop the new product or to buy a certain store or not to buy the store. Your strategies are different depending on what games and what players you have. And finally, you have payoffs. So payoffs are what, what you get from choosing a certain strategy. So for example, if you think about two stores competing, if, if you played the move, the strategy, opening a store in that area, and your opponent has played this, the move, not opening the store in that area, then your, pro your payoff would be you, you're making money. And your opponent's payoff would be not making money because he didn't, he didn't open a store in that area. So payoffs are always associated with the players as well as associated with the specific strategies that they chose. And finally, games theory, games can be represented using a payoff matrix. So in the next slide, we will look at what a payoff matrix is. So this is a very typical example of a payoff matrix. And you can see that to the left, you'll see me. And on top, you'll see my partner. So these are your players. And beside each of these names, you will see the words three hours, six hours, and nine hours. So these are your available strategies. These are your moves. And then corresponding to each move, you will see two numbers. So these are your payoffs for these chosen strategies. So for example, if I, if I chose the move three hours and my partner also chose the move three hours, well, my payoff would be, the payoff would be one comma one. And my payoff would be the number to the, to the left hand side. And my partner's payoff would be the number to the right hand side. So in this case, both of us will have payoff one. If I put in nine hours of work and my opponent puts three hours of work into this project or into this um, work or into this assignment that we're doing, then my payoff is minus eight and his payoff is plus two. Finally, if I, let's say I put in six hours of work and he puts in nine hours of work, then my, pro my payoff is six, six and his payoff is minus two. So always remember that the number to the left-hand side corresponds to the player whose name appears on the left-hand side. And the number to the right-hand side corresponds to the payoff of the player who is on top, whose name appears on the top of the matrix. So now our first topic is the Nash equilibrium. And I'm not going to give you the definitions. We will work out, we'll try to work out the definitions from the actual playoff matrix, the payoff matrix. So again, we will look at the payoff matrix from the last slide, um, where you have my partner and I doing this, let's say doing a project, doing a school project. So look at this matrix. And if you need, pause the video and try to think what are our best moves? What should we play? What should we choose? What are the strategies that will maximize my return? And what will my opponent choose to maximize his return? My partner choose to maximize his return. Well, we first ask a very simple question. What is my best response if my partner works for three hours? Well, obviously you can see, if I work for three hours, my payoff is one. If I work for six hours, my payoff is minus four. And if I work for nine hours, my, opponent, my payoff is minus eight. So obviously, three hours is the best response. So if my opponent chooses three hours, I should also choose three hours. And remember, in game theory, we don't care about what our partner or what our opponent's payoff is. We only care about what 
our return is by the actions we've chosen. So don't worry about what the number on the right hand says, only worry about what the number on the left hand is. So now we ask ourselves the same question. If my opponent plays six hours, what is my best response? Well, if you go through every box, you'll see that my best payoff, the, best, the biggest number I can achieve is four, and that happens when I play six hours. So if my opponent plays six hours, I should also play six hours. And finally, we asked ourselves, what is the best response to nine hours? And of course, if you go through the list again, you'll see that my best return is six, and that corresponds to six hours of work. So that tells me if my opponent works for nine hours, I should only work for six hours.